We come now to the heart of the Christian faith. The gospel of Jesus Christ either stands or falls upon the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we have no gospel. Our faith is vain. Our preaching is vain. We are still in our sins, and those who have died in Christ have perished. And we are of all men most to be pitied. If Jesus did rise from the dead, then all of his claims are true, and we better take the more earnest heed to the things which he said. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And you cannot come to the Father but by Him. Salvation is only through faith in Him. And he that believeth in Jesus is not condemned, but he that does not believe is condemned already, seeing he doth, doth not believe in the only begotten Son of God. And so we come to Luke's account of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher bringing the spices that they had prepared and certain others with them. Just how many women came to the tomb that morning, the Bible doesn't say. Whether or not there was one group of women or two group of women or more, the Bible doesn't say. Luke only gives us a very brief account touching highlights, and that seems to be the case in all of the Gospels each of the Gospels adding a little different slant that was not brought out in the other Gospels. It is possible that there were two or more groups of ladies that came from different sections of Jerusalem to the tomb that morning. No doubt many of them had come from the area of Bethany, the house of Lazarus. They perhaps came from other areas of Jerusalem and arrived at the tomb at different times. In every gospel, Mary Magdalene is listed as one of those who came to the tomb. In Luke's gospel, he adds also Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. Mark also tells us Mary Magdalene and Salome and Mary, the mother of James. But Luke adds here that there were others also, women unnamed. How large a group, the Bible doesn't tell us. It could have been a rather large group of women who gathered together. It is interesting that here in Luke's gospel, as we look at chapter 24, he's going to tell us of that day that Jesus rose from the dead. He's going to tell us some of the things that happened in the morning. And then he's going to share some of the things that happened in the afternoon. And finally, he's going to close off telling us the things that happened that night that Jesus rose from the dead. In trying to put together a composite of the four Gospels, realizing that each of the Gospel gives us a little different view 
some extra little insights. There are those in reading the various gospel accounts of the resurrection, reading them in just a cursory surface way, would imagine that there perhaps are discrepancies in the account. Let me give to you a possible sequence of events on that resurrection morning that would harmonize all four of the gospel accounts. Early in the morning, the first day of the week, while it is still dark, Two groups of ladies, at least, start towards the tomb from different sections of Jerusalem. It was about this time that they were starting towards the tomb that the angel of the Lord rolled back the stone and sat upon it, freaking out the guards who ran to the Jews who had hired them to guard the tomb, telling them of this experience. Mary Magdalene, in her anxiety to get to the tomb quickly, hurried ahead of the other ladies and arrived at the tomb and just saw that the stone was rolled back, looking in, seeing the body of Jesus not there, rushed off immediately to report it to Peter and John. Not seeing any angel herself at that first visit, figured that someone had stolen the body of Jesus or had removed it and thus ran to inform Peter and John that she found the tomb empty. As the other women arrived shortly after Mary had left, they saw that the stone was rolled back and the angels told them, of the resurrection. Now Mark mentions one angel, Matthew and Luke mention two angels. Mark perhaps mentioned only one angel because one of them spoke, the other was just standing there. In reality there could have been a host of angels and I believe there probably was uh, hanging around the tomb. And uh, at times they could see one and in times they could see another and times more. We know that when Jesus was born there was a lot of angelic activity. An angel of the Lord came to the shepherds who were watching their uh, flocks in the field at night. And the angel of the Lord declared unto them, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign. You'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with this angel a multitude of heavenly hosts as they were praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So the shepherds first saw one angel, then they saw a multitude of angels. Peter tells us that the angels were extremely curious about God's whole redemptive plan, which things the angels desired to look into. When Peter drew his sword to defend Jesus in the garden, Jesus said, put your sword away, Peter, don't you realize that at this moment I could call a legion of angels to deliver me? 
And so the angels, and of course we remember as he was praying there in the garden, his disciples were sleeping and the angels came and ministered to him. And so I have no difficulty that Mark mentions only one angel and Luke and Matthew mention two. As I say, it could be that Mark only makes mention of the one, the one that was speaking unto them. And it is quite possible that as Mark was trying to get the details of this whole experience, he said to them, now, where was the angel standing, referring to the angel that was talking to them? And they said, they're on the right side of the room. And so Mark tells us that the angel was standing there on the right side. But uh, the fact that he only mentions one does not preclude the fact that there were more angels about the tomb at that time. Now, these ladies, having met the angels and told by the angels that Jesus was risen, as he had said, went to tell the rest of the disciples this good news. And as they leave the tomb, John comes running up and sees the stone rolled away and stands there for a moment as Peter catches up with him and Peter goes right into the tomb, John following him, and they see the linen clothes that were wrapped around Jesus lying there and the napkin that was on his head over in a separate place folded neatly there by itself. And they leave the tomb. Peter wondering what it's all about. And John believing that Jesus is risen from the dead. At this point, Mary Magdalene arrives back at the tomb. When she told Peter and John the tomb was empty, they went running off. She couldn't keep up with them. They arrived, looked over the scene, left, and now Mary Magdalene comes. And as she looks into the tomb, she sees the angel there. And the angel asked her woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And she said, they have taken away my Lord. I don't know where he is, where they've put him. And, G and Mary turned away from the tomb. Now that to me is an interesting thing. You know, when you want the Lord, angels won't do. <laughs> to me, if I'd see an angel, and I'd be so excited, uh, I'd probably just be, you know, be just there in awe, but man, when you're wanting the Lord, even angels won't satisfy. And she turned away from the angel, and Jesus was standing there, but she did not recognize him. Remember, it is still rather dark. She sees the form standing there. And her eyes are not, no doubt blurred with the tears. And so she sees the blurry form of a man. And because the place where the tomb was hewn out of the cliff was a garden, she supposed that this man standing there was the gardener. And she also supposed that he was the one, perhaps, who had removed the body of Jesus. And so Mary said to him, Sir, if you will just tell me where you've put him, I'll carry him away. I love the strength of love. I imagine that Jesus was a fairly good-sized man. 
And I don't suppose that Mary was that strong. But her love was very strong. And if you'll just tell me where you've put that body, I'll, I'll, I'll carry him away. And Jesus said, Mary. Now I am certain that he had a special voice intonation for her because there were so many Marys. There were probably about four Marys that we know of common name and if Jesus would just say Mary he'd get Watts all over the place <laughs> so he probably had a special little voice intonation for each one so that when he said Mary they would recognize that as their individual Mary Mary Magdalene being so special to him he said Mary with that voice that she recognized. She cried, Rabboni, Master. And she came home, she came over and grabbed him around the neck like she was going to never let go again. <laughs> like a drowning person. She grabbed hold of him and began to cling to him. And he said, Mary, and here's the unfortunate translation in King James, touch me not. That's not what he said. He said, Mary, don't cling to me. Oh, Mary, let go. You're choking me. <laughs> don't cling to me, but go and tell my disciples that I have risen. Indeed. Fascinating to me that the first one commissioned to preach the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was a woman. Commissioned by Jesus himself. Go and tell the disciples, I have risen indeed. Right after this, as Mary goes to bring the good news, Jesus appeared to the other women as they were on their way from the tomb with the message of the angels. And when they saw him, they held onto his feet and they worshiped him. And thus you put together the composite, the events of that morning from the four Gospels tying each account into the story with the possible sequence of events of the resurrection morning. Coming back to Luke's account, on the first day, of the week very early in the morning they that is the women came to the sepulcher bringing the spices which they had prepared they were wanting to touch the body of Jesus just once more they were wanting to express this last activity of love, bringing spices for the body of Jesus. Three days, three nights in the grave. You remember when Lazarus had died and Jesus came rather late. When they brought Jesus to the tomb where Lazarus had been entombed, interred, Jesus commanded that they roll the stone away and Martha said, Oh Lord, 
better not do that. It's been four days. It smells pretty bad by now. It didn't seem to trouble them that Jesus had been dead three days and perhaps decom decomposition would create a rather offensive odor. They wanted to touch the body once more. They wanted to put the spices there and show this last act of love. You see, though their hope was dead, the hope of a new age, the hope of the kingdom of God, though that was now dead, their love was not dead. They still loved him. They could have very well, thinking he was dead and it was all over, they could have thought, what a deceiver. How he deceived us. But there doesn't seem to be any indication of that at all. Nothing but love. Disappointment, oh yes, for sure. But brought by love to touch once more. It is interesting how that we do relate a person to the body. Somehow we, in thinking of a person, we, we always in our minds relate that person to the body. And probably rightfully so, but the real me is not this body. The real me is spirit. Now, inasmuch as this body is the medium by which I express me, you relate the body to me. But once my spirit moves out of this body, this body is nothing. Just an empty tent. from which the Spirit has moved. And yet we cannot, you know, in our minds really divorce the person from the body, so often we want to touch the body once more. As we stand by the casket and we know that they're going to bring the lid down now, and as we look at that body, but it's just the shell, the, the one that we knew is not there. And yet, where there is that relationship, I want to just touch. And, and the touch is always just sort of a shock because there is no warmth. There, it's cold, it's stiff, there's no response. And it, it is always just sort of a, a shocking thing, and yet we seem to have to sort of touch. That we might have the reality of the fact that the spirit has moved out of that body. They were wanting to just touch the body of Jesus just once more. And so coming with their spices, they had one concern. That big stone that they rolled over the opening of the sepulcher. How could these frail women move it? But we read, verse 2, And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. I do not think for a moment that the stone was rolled away to let Jesus out. I think the stone was rolled away to let them in so that they could see that the tomb was empty. That they might have that witness. The tomb is empty. Their concern on the way as to who would roll the stone away, their worry about that and concern. But by the time they arrive at the tomb, the question of who is going to roll the stone away is answered. The stone is already rolled away. 
It is interesting that so often those things that we are so worried about, how are we going to handle that? By the time we arrive, we found that the Lord has preceded us and already taken care of it. So many of our worries are absolutely needless. You know, Satan likes to use worry as a, as a tool to sort of torment us. And, and we have a situation that we're facing, and as we contemplate it, we're so worried, you know, what are we going to do? You know, when we get there, what's going to happen? We're just all so concerned, and by the time we arrive there, we find there's no problem at all. The Lord's already been there. He's already taken care of it. And all of that worry, all of that anxiety was in vain. I get so angry with myself. Wasting so much time worrying about things that never do come to pass. Things that the Lord already takes care of before I have a chance to mess it up myself. <laughs> and they entered in and found not the body of Jesus. They were wanting to touch it. They were wanting to put these spices on it one last time but they didn't find the body there. But all they saw were the grave clothes. The body of Jesus was gone. It is at this point that the two angels appeared to them in the form of men, however, wearing shining garments. Their first reaction was one of fear. They were afraid, verse 5. And they bowed down their faces to the earth. And the angels at this point sort of rebuked them. It was a gentle rebuke, but a rebuke nonetheless. The question, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. They were looking for Jesus in the place where dead bodies were kept. Thus rebuked, why are you seeking the living here among the dead? He's not here. You're looking in the wrong place if you're wanting to find Jesus. He's not among the dead, he's among the living. And he told you about this when you were still in the area of the Galilee. He told you that he would be delivered into the hands of sinful men who would crucify him and slay him. But on the third day, he would rise again. And this is the third day. And suddenly, it all clicked. Have you ever had a situation that was sort of a puzzling situation and there were a lot of loose ends, but suddenly, the whole thing just sort of came together? And, and, and there was that instant Light turn on, and you say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It used to be that way for me in geometry. <laughs> it would seem such a mysterious thing until suddenly the concept would click in my brain, and then it was just as simple as could be. I said, whoa, yeah. You know, and it, just, it would just come together, and... and you had then the, the full grasp, the full understanding. There was no longer a mystery. You know, it just was so logical now. As the angels make mention of this, suddenly the whole thing clicked. They remembered the words of Jesus, but they put the whole thing together. Now, I believe... that though they had heard Jesus talk about his resurrection, 
Their orthodoxy kept them from understanding what he was saying. For they did believe in the resurrection at the last day. You remember when Jesus said to Martha, Martha, your brother will live again. When she was rebuking Jesus for being so late. Lord, where were you? Lord, what took you so long to get here? Lord, if you'd have just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, but your brother's going to live again. Oh, yes, Lord, I know in the last day, the great resurrection. And in thinking of the resurrection, in their minds, in their orthodox view of the resurrection, they thought of the resurrection only in terms of the last day. In the book of Job, Chapter 19, where Job cried, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in the latter days, or in the last days, shall stand upon the earth, and though the worms eat my body, in my flesh I shall see God. But that resurrection of the last day that Job spoke about. Again, Daniel said, that many of them that sleep in the dust shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and contempt, the resurrection of the last day. So that was the orthodox belief of the Jews, that in the last days there would be this general resurrection, some unto eternal life, some unto eternal damnation and condemnation. And so when Jesus said, they're going to crucify me, but I will rise again. Their orthodox view of the resurrection caused them to believe, oh yes, he'll rise again in the last days, you know, in that great resurrection. And they did not realize that he was speaking about an immediate resurrection on the third day. And thus, they were blind to what Jesus was saying because their view of the resurrection was only of the last day's resurrection. But Jesus, in talking to Martha concerning her brother, when she said, yes, Lord, I know in the last days, Jesus said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. Martha, do you believe this? So Jesus is trying to say, no, I'm not talking about the resurrection of the last days. I'm talking about now. And he went to the tomb and raised Lazarus from the dead. But they just could not grasp what Jesus had been saying. And the angel is sort of rebuking them. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Don't you remember while he was yet with you in the Galilee how he told you that he was going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men, they were going to crucify him, but on the third day he'd rise again? And they remembered his words, only now with a clear understanding of what they meant. Now we read here that they returned from the sepulcher and told all of these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. There was a great number of disciples. And, and so these ladies told the story. We saw the angels. They're at the tomb. They told us that Jesus was risen just like he said. Reminded us of what he said there in the Galilee, how he was going to be crucified, but the third day would rise again.
But verse 11, it says, but their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. These pragmatic men figured that the women were just hysterical, and, and they didn't believe them. Later on, and we'll get this in our next lesson, the afternoon, the things that happened on the afternoon, but we need to jump to one portion of that experience right now. Later on that afternoon is the two disciples were on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus joined with them and began to talk with them. As they were, well, and... Well, this, this will be repeated next week, but it, I like the humor of Jesus, really. Um, he said, hey, what happened to you guys? Man, you look like death warmed over. What's your problem? They said, you must be a stranger around here, fella. You're probably the only one that doesn't know the things that have been going on in Jerusalem the last few days. She said, what things? What are you talking about? And they gave their testimony of Jesus. How that Jesus from Nazareth had done such mighty works and miracles and wonders. Went around doing good, but they crucified him and He's been buried, and this is now the third day. And this morning, some of the hysterical women were trying to say that, you know, he rose again, that the tomb was empty. They saw angels, and they saw him. And Jesus began to rebuke them, saying, Oh, fools, slow of heart to believe. And then he began to go back to Moses and expound the prophecies that dealt with him and death and resurrection and all, and went all through the Old Testament. Here is the tragedy of unbelief. The ladies come with their story. We saw the angels. And then we saw Jesus himself. He appeared unto them. They held his feet. They worshiped him. And they come back and tell this bunch of gloomy men who are there just, you know, what are we going to do now? Kicking rocks and, you know, upset. And they say, the Lord's risen. We saw him. We held his feet, you know. Ah, oh, come on. Don't give us that. Sometimes our logical, analytical, practical minds hold us back from what God would like to do in our lives because we want to figure it out. We want a reason for it. When we were in Tucson, we were poor. I had a dead battery in my car, but I didn't have the money to buy a new one for a couple of weeks. And so I would always park on a tilt, you know, so you could push and jump in and start it. Oh, for those blessed days of gear shifts, you know, where you could pop the clutch. And, and we'd come out to this car, and we'd come out sometimes to the car, and I'd go to start it, and then go, and 
And my wife would say, well, honey, let's pray that the car will start. And I said, Kay, you don't understand mechanics. When a battery is dead, a battery is dead. And when a battery has a dead cell, when you've run out that thing on, it just, it won't start. Don't be foolish. So, said, well, I'm going to pray anyhow. I said, you can't pray <laughs> that the car will start. And she'd bow her head and pray. She said, I'll try it again. And I would be so upset, I'd just show you, and the thing would start. <laughs> Sometimes we know too much, and it stands in the way of our faith. And here were these men, practical, analytical. He's dead. When you're dead, you're dead. And when these women are coming with this glorious news that should have really just caused them all to get excited, they're still moping around, and these two guys on the road to Emmaus look like death themselves. And of course, in verse 10, it gives us the names of three of the ladies, but then it says, and other women that were with them, which told these things to the apostles, but their words seemed as idle tales. They believed them not. Then Peter arose, ran to the sepulcher, and of course John tells us that he was with him too. Stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. What's happened? He, he didn't really believe yet. He was just wondering, what does this mean? Has someone taken the body, or what does this mean? John, on the other hand, when he saw it, believed. The empty tomb was sufficient. John says, all right. And so, in our next study, these are the things that happened in the morning. They probably happened all before 6 o'clock. It was probably around 5 o'clock when the whole scenario started and was all over within an hour. The events that we've been covering of the morning of the resurrection. Now, in our next lesson, we'll find out what happened in the afternoon of the resurrection. A tremendous story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Shall we pray? Father, we're so grateful for the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. and for the proofs of the resurrection. Lord, we thank you tonight that the resurrection of Jesus has caused us to be born again to a living hope because of his resurrection from the dead. The living hope of the inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and fades not away that you have reserved in heaven for us who you are keeping by your power. Lord, help us that we would not be slow of heart to believe. But in examining the evidence, 
may we indeed believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead that we might be saved. In his name we pray. Amen. I'd like to just mention a few of the proofs of the resurrection from the dead that we find. First of all, in as much as some of them did not believe, their change of heart is proof. Thomas, I sort of thank the Lord for Thomas, doubting Thomas. I will not believe until I can actually touch. And yet, when he was challenged face to face with Jesus, my Lord, my God. The change in the apostles can only be explained by the actual resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Look at what Peter was before. How he denied the Lord. Weak, vacillating. But oh, what a dynamic man after the resurrection. The, the boldness that Peter then possessed. If our courts are valid, truth is determined on the basis of eyewitnesses testifying in a cooperating type of testimony. And if two or three witnesses will testify Eyewitness, I was there, I saw that man that is sitting there in the court, I saw him pull the gun, I saw him, I heard him, that's the man, and two or three witnesses, we establish truth. We accept it as truth. If you have two or three witnesses that will substantiate the same story concerning a person, as far as the court is concerned, it's valid evidence to the truth of the matter. If there is any validity to our system of jurisprudence, then you would have to accept that Jesus rose from the dead as a fact because we have many witnesses, eyewitnesses, who testified to having seen and talked to the risen Lord. Over 500 eyewitnesses. That's kind of hard evidence to disallow. But one further clincher. These men not only witnessed of that fact, but they were willing to die for their witness. Now, had they concocted a story when it came right down to it, as Satan said concerning Job, skin for skin, all a man has will he give for his life. That had they been making up a story, when it came right down to either holding to that story as being true or being clubbed to death. No man's going to stand there and be clubbed to death for a lie. No man's going to be stoned to death for a lie. No man's going to be beaten to death for a lie. No man's going to be burned to death for a lie. No man's going to be beheaded for a lie. And the fact that these men all died violent deaths at the hands of other men because of what they witnessed 
only confirms the more the truth of the witness that they made. And as Paul the Apostle said, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Established fact. And has become the first fruit of those who rise from the dead. <laughs>